You may be seated. The first lesson from Deuteronomy. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inherent inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all of the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from the, your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by the imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders, and he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I put my trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation, there shall no evil happen to you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you. To keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you in their hands. Lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. You shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him. And show him my salvation. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you please stand now for the gospel acclamation. Lord Jesus, open the scriptures to us. Make our hearts burn while you speak to us. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. After his baptism, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, 
returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you, then, will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil looked, took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, kindle in us the fire of your love, and by that divine light illuminate your holy word to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. Last week we had the <coughs> perennial reading that comes before Lent. We read an account of the Transfiguration and being the year of Luke, it was out of Luke. And today we do the perennial first reading of the first Sunday of Lent, which is the temptation of Christ. And here we have it written again by Luke. I started last week to unfold a process that's put before us. And before we go into Lent, we're supposed to have this image of the transfiguration before us. And we're supposed to go from where we are to where Jesus is on the mountain. And the path that's been laid out for millennia by Christians, what they notice and categorize, if you will, is a process of purification, illumination, and transformation. So here's the image we're going to. Just keep your eye on the prize. This is where we're headed to. And I mentioned last week, whenever I learned about the transfiguration growing up, it was all about Jesus. It's about telling who he is, and it's a revelation of who he is, and the tie into the Old Testament with Elijah and Moses is there, and all this good stuff. <laughs> but I came to understand in later life, especially reading the church fathers and uh, other Eastern Orthodox writers, is that it's about us. It is every bit, this picture, this image, is every bit about us as it is about Jesus. And that was news to me. This word transfiguration we use is, is better translated from the Greek as metamorphosis. Oh, metamorphosis, I mean, that, that has power to it far more, I think, for the average person than transfiguration. I mean, metamorphosis, that, that's the caterpillar to the butterfly. I mean, that's... It's quite a word picture to hang on to there. And a word that might be good is transformation. We don't want to use a, you know, a $10 word like metamorphosis. I put here Eastern Orthodox teaching on this. It's so wonderful. There's a website here, and you all have a PDF of this. You can go back home and pull it up. And just look around there. You'll find wonderful teaching by various Eastern fathers on what this metamorphosis is. So I'm saying it's Jesus and us. Well, we're looking at transfigured Jesus. So what about the us part? 
How am I going to get there? How does that happen? What do you see? Jesus, who he is. And what we're seeing is us, who we are to be. When you're looking at the transfigured Jesus, it's not him. It's like, I'm, you know, those, those ads, you know, your picture here, you know, it's supposed to be you. Yeah, you in this picture, you transfigured. What are we to be? Him. This metamorphosis process is also called theosis. And it's shocking. It's shocking. Theosis means becoming like God. And you go, I think I'm in the wrong church. That's, that's not, that can't be, that's heretical, isn't it? It's like, no. And you can look up a, um, a, a writing of C.S. Lewis, 20th century Anglican. And he talks about becoming little Christs. You know, Google that up and check it out. I'm not sure. I think we might have that writing. I think we have that writing in our resources on our website. It's the same idea. Look, it's biblical. It's, it's not heretical. This is from Paul. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as, through reflect, as though reflected in a mirror, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So it's a process, bit by bit by bit. For this comes from the Lord, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to do this renovation in us, this transformation, this metamorphosis. How do we get there? Purification, elimination, and transformation. A note. The bookending episodes that we see here. Before the transfiguration, Jesus predicted his passion. Here's what's going to be happening. And right after it, they go down the mountain and they encounter the story of the demoniac boy. What's this telling you? The previous episode showed you a world that's going to kill Jesus. The following episode shows you a world where Satan is in charge and cannot be defeated. They couldn't exercise the boy. They were at a loss. That's our world. There you go. Whether you're transforming or are transformed or not, this is the world that God has chosen to put us in. And, and it's not by accident, because we see in the reading today that Jesus is led by the Spirit into a world where he's going to be sorely tempted. So it's showing you this is part of God's plan. This is not Satan ambushing Jesus. No, 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 no. This is part of the plan. This world is our desert and our wilderness. And you do well to see it that way. To say, God wants me to be in here. He has a transcendent plan for me being here. And all these things that are coming my way that I don't like, that are sometimes even hurting me, it's like, hang in there, kid. There's a purpose to it. This is our place of trial, of testing, of tempting. This word in the Greek, perazzo, and it's also in the Septuagint, to, to try, to try something, to see how it is, is going to work, to make trial of, to test for the purpose of ascertaining his quality or what he thinks or how he will behave, to try or test one's faith, virtue, or character. And you know, these things are meant not simply to taste, but to temper. It makes it stronger. It makes it better. It makes it more durable. All those processes they put metal or steel through in making it a, a sword, you know, it's to make it better. It, it, it sure is brutal on the metal, you know. You don't want to be that metal, but it's, it's you know, the metal maker is saying, this is good for you, kid. This is for your own good. And it truly is. In the Old Testament, it, this word is used of God to inflict evils upon one in order to prove his character and the steadfastness of his faith. There's none of us who have ever gone through any kind of physical athletic training doesn't understand this. You just get pushed and pushed and pushed and one more and one more and one more. 
And sometimes a kid, and I, you know, they're saying on that last rep, you know, with the barbell, it's all you, man, it's all you. Of course, it isn't all you, you know. Guy's taking off about 20 pounds with his fingertips so you can get that last press out, you know. And in that image, who do you think the Holy Spirit is, guys? We're not doing this alone. Here's the divine irony. God uses Satan's wiles against him. God uses the sinful fallen world and uses it to test us, to strengthen us, to bring us closer to him, to become ever more radical in our trust and dependence upon him because we can't beat this world. And so it moves us further toward Jesus. The only time people repent is when they have a bottom in their life. They have to bottom out. And the world, ironically, Satan's world, will beat us down and we will not be able to work within it or succeed. And, and you've got to reach for Jesus. How can we meet the challenge? Just the way Jesus did. As he did, so will we. What are the two main things you hear in the gospel reading today? He's got the Holy Spirit. And he uses the word of God. He's leaning on the word of God and the power of the spirit. There you go. Just take that and run with that. Let's look at purification. Romans. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So purification in large measure is going to come by changing how you think. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good and pleasing and perfect will. This is a quote from Joel Osteen. Not my favorite preacher, but he makes some good points in here, and I brought this up the other week. It's easy to go through life holding on to things that are weighing you down. Guilt, resentment, doubt, worry. I don't know what he means by easy. I don't think he means the same thing I th No, it's not easy. This stuff screws you up and makes life harder. I think he doesn't mean it easy in a literal way. It, it, it's, it's within our range to not pay attention to that, to become used to it, and just incorporate that and think that that's part of our life. The problem is when you allow these things in, they're taking up space for the good things that should be there. Imagine your life as a container. You were created to be filled with joy, peace, confidence, creativity, but if you allow worry, shame, and other negativity in, it pushes out good thoughts. You know, that's fine for a, um, a seminar, you know, on cognitive therapy techniques. And the thing is, you were created to be filled should be, if it's a Christian preaching, <laughs> you're supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. These other things are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. And cognitive therapy will tell you, list all your bad ideas, take them out, and replace them with good ideas. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just don't know why you need a pulpit to preach it, you know, just get some room and do a seminar. These guilt, resentment, doubt, worry, he is right on the money. And the problem is that I see people, even people who claim to be Christians, are very comfortable with living a life that's being driven by deep resentments. They think it's part of their life <coughs> to be resentful, to be angry, to be hateful. Because they're angry, resentful, and hateful, the right people, those, bad, those are bad people and they don't see their sin. Let's look at resentment. Let's start here. I always find this pretty easy. There aren't too many human beings who will say, I don't have any resentments of anything. I usually say, why don't you just sit down alone for about five minutes with a paper and pen and see if a few come to you. And if nothing else, they'll probably resent having to sit alone and putting something on paper. And bingo, we've yeah. got a resentment. These are excerpts in the big book of AA. Whatever our protestations, they're talking about the world, you know, everybody else, what they're doing wrong, how they hurt me, how dare those people, how can they do that? Whatever our protestations, aren't most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentments? and our self-pity. 
selfishness, self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Most people, harboring resentment, don't think of themselves as self-centered. They don't occur to them. But resentment and holding on to it and living within it is a form of self-centeredness. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity, we step on the toes of other fellows and they retaliate. And sometimes they hurt us, seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that at some time in the past we've made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. This is anti-world. This is not what the world is proclaiming. The world is busy blaming other people for every trouble that you have in your life and demanding that they all change. Change me? No. I am not the problem. I'm the victim. Blaming the victim. You're shaming the victim. Okay. And time and again, you will hear this excuse given like, well, I know they did X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z pretty, pretty awful. But you know, it's not their fault. This is anti that. It's 180 degrees. And in AA, they used to say, my sponsor would say, even if you're only 10% of the problem, yes, own that 10%. Don't worry about the 90%. Own the 10%. That's your side of the street. The alcoholic is an extreme example of self will run riot. Most people are. Though he usually doesn't think so, most people don't think so. And above everything, we must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it kills us. God makes that promise possible. See, for the alcoholic, it's a life and death issue. And for the average person, even if they recognize these things, it's not a life and death issue. If the alcoholic doesn't let go of these things, he'll pick up a drink and the drink can lead him to death. It's very simple. And it's a, it's a concept and a perception most people really have no idea of. They don't get the idea when I'm getting angry and resentful of, oh my God, I gotta let go of this. I could die from this. That's not no. The interesting thing is that in Paul's eyes, you are dead. He tells people, you're dead. It's not like you're sick and maybe you can get better. He says, no, you're dead. You're spiritually dead. You're Bruce Willis in the sixth sense. You think you're alive and you're dead. And that's Paul. So of course it's a life and death issue for everyone. And there often seems no way entirely to get rid of self without God's aid. Many of us tried, tried to live a better life, found the rules, did this, did that, and we couldn't. We had to have God's help. We have to prepare for the Holy Spirit to do the work of transforming us, and that's a purification. So once you realize this is my problem, I can't uh, satisfactorily be victorious over it. I can't change myself and you know, become a person not driven by fears and resentments and that. I want to. I don't want to be so self-centered. I want to be God-centered. Like, there's only so far I can go by trying hard. It's not happening. I need help here and it's going to take the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you make sure the Holy Spirit has a chance to get in there? How am I going to have Ed, you know, fix my door in my closet if I don't open the door and let him in the front door? He can't get in. He's really welling. i got the tools, got the know-how, got the spirit. No one's letting him in. Same with us and the Holy Spirit. God will not bust down your door and line you up and coerce you. That's what the world does. But God is a God of love. God will court you like a lover. God will let you be in your sin and let you suffer like a loving parent, a loving brother, a loving spouse lets an alcoholic hit bottom and stops enabling them. They don't want him to get hurt. 
they're going to stop saving them, and God does that. He allows us to fall and get hurt, and he's patiently waiting. He's like the father and the prodigal son. He's in the tower waiting. He's looking. When are you going to come? When are you going to come? I can't force you. Just please. Resentment is a number one offender from its stem. All forms of spiritual disease. So insightful. It's not just a resentment. From that, oh my goodness. What can happen? We have been not only mentally and physically, but we're spiritually ill. It's plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. You know, I'm hitting resentment hard. I wouldn't have, except in the recent past, I've encountered people who seem to be Christians, and they're run by resentments. It, it just stunning. You know what I'm talking about, Penny? I mean, like, shocking, just like you're, you're embracing and, and just resentful, like so obvious, and they're Christians, and they think they are, and they feel righteous, and it's scary to see that lack of insight. So I, I figure I better preach this, <laughs> you know. We found it is fatal, I told you about Paul, since we're dead. When harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the Spirit. It, that's not esoteric. <laughs> Isn't that make sense? I've got a heart and mind full of resentment. It's like, well, the Holy Spirit doesn't have room in there. Really? <laughs> it's like, no. No. Here's Father Michael Gillis. I gave you Joel Osteen. Here's a wonderful Orthodox priest, you know, sort of leaven the other. He says, purification, although, it not, although if not possible without the grace of God, is mostly a participatory activity of the mind and life. That is, one must work at purification. And he says it very tenderly. He doesn't want to wind up with work salvation. It's, but you, you do have to do some work. There is something. There is what um, Leanne Page, if any of you remember her, God rest her soul, you know, she would talk about moral effort. It's going to take moral effort on your part to get there. You can't manage what you don't measure. Right, William? William gave me that. William's an engineer. <laughs> But what a great, you know, I told him, I kid, and I told you guys, I, when he told me that, I said, William, why didn't you tell me that 50 years ago, you know? You fell down on me, come on. But I wish I had that information as a young man. I put this resource page here. You can find there the Good Shepherd Guide to the Steps. And one of the brilliant things about the steps and working through it, it does what William is saying. It helps you measure, take inventory, size up, look at. Because part of what we were talking about, William and I, is noting progress. You know what I'm saying? If, if you don't measure where you're at, then you're not going to realize in a year or two how far you've come. You can't really <laughs> realize what's going on. He was talking about blood sugar levels, you know. I'm talking about how many miles I can do on the treadmill or at what pace or at what incline. You know, if I just take the walks on the streets like I see other people, that doesn't work for me. I want to see how I'm doing, you know what I'm saying. So I do the treadmill in the gym and I see like, wow, I'm up to four miles an hour. You know, a few weeks ago I'm at 2.5. This is great. And those little physical things have application in our spiritual lives. Makes sense. Purification happens in the steps, primarily in steps four through five. That's the self-examination and confession to God and another. But, I'm putting in highlights, after steps one, two, and three. So, what happens, let me... Yeah, I do it later. I'll get to it. I'm going to cover one, two, two, and three a little bit later. So what you do in four and five, you're writing it down. You're writing down, start out all your resentments. Then you put down your fears. 
Then you do a self-examination of your sex life. I think that's about it. Those are the primary things that get listed. Would you say, Steve, does that make sense? Resentments, fears, inventory of your sex life. Is there another major thing in there I forget? You write it down. And then you seek the Lord. Because you begin to localize and see what are the things that are underneath this and driving these things. And you say, I can't change myself, but I know you can, God. And we ask God to come in and remove the defects of character. Sometimes they're very deeply seated. And sometimes removal of a defect of character, character, Robbie, is the healing of a wound. You know what I'm saying? Is that when you get underneath the sin or the this, or that underneath it as a very unhealed deep wound from your childhood. So it doesn't just get that filth out of you. It's like, no, sometimes the Holy Spirit hand of healing needs to come in. That's the defect. You have an unhealed wound, buddy. That's all. We want to take care of that. This is a very holistic enterprise you enter into with Jesus. And the other thing is, a lot of these things come from our instincts, like run wild. I can say it that way. Basic instincts. Bill talks of this in the 12 and 12. That it's our ins these defects of character, our instinct gone awry. And they're basic instincts that God has given us. So I tell people, does anyone remember them? I know some of you know the literature. I, I know, I think having a place in society is, you know, one of them. Sex is one of them, sex drive. I always remember that, right, Steve? So there's a couple of others, you know. Fiscal. Fiscal security. What kind Danger. of security? Money. Fiscal. Money. Money. Oh. Money. Emotional. Material security and emotional security. Yes, we did these things. Yeah, absolutely. And he says that there are, are these defects are those gone wrong. So I'd say people, you know, I think to some degree, healing is very often a very important part. I used to say to people at times, heal the wound, bury the sin. Heal the wound, bury the sin. When the wound is healed, the reactions that come from you when people poke you in that spot, it's okay. You're over it. You're done. It's okay. And the other stuff is, I tell people, is, it's, it's not so much God removing these defects. It's not so much a, an extraction as uh, orthodontics. God's going to take those instincts and... and reshape them so they're healthy. So you don't get rid of your sex life, although some do, God wants whatever, but he gives you a healthy sex life. And, and you do seek financial security in the world, but not rapaciously, not fearfully, not, it's, it's, it's in good ways, etc., etc. So. Sometimes people talk about removing these defects of character, which is step six and seven, but really in certain ways they're removed by being reformed, by being returned to the way God wants you to be. And that's very biblical. The theology of that is very strong because God takes us and reshapes us and remakes us. That image of the potter with the clay, you know, he just reshapes, same clay, that was a disaster in a minute, and reshapes it and spins the wheel and reshapes it, now it's looking good. Same clay, same you, Mark. We're not getting rid of you, Mark. We're not getting rid of you. God's not getting rid of you. He loves you to pieces. And he's gonna bring you into the trueness. You know, there's a line, to thine own self be true. And, and, and I would change that a bit, wouldn't I, Trey? I would change it to, to thy true self be true. Because sometimes we have an idea of who we think we are. It's wrong. Get you the triple X on Family Feud, you know. Uh, <coughs> no, wrong, wrong answer. And we need God to even reveal to us who we really are so that we can be true to that self. Write it down. Seek the Lord, six and seven. Repent which means change your life, not beat your breast saying, I'm sorry. That's not a bad start, <laughs> you know, if it's sincere. 
But it, amendment of life, change your ways, comes into 8 and 9 where you're making amends with people, making restitution. And Zacchaeus, the wee little man up in the sycamore tree, great example. And what does he say, if you remember? I love it. This is a guy who's a tax collector who's been cheating people for I don't know how long. And he's telling Jesus he's going to make restitution like, I forget, double, triple the amount, you know. If I stole $10, I'll give you back 50 whatever. Well, that's the spirit. And so this is part of the purification process. And what we see in Jesus is he redoes humanity's wrongs. And so we do that in our own lives, and to the extent we can, we redo what we did wrong and amend it. The Jews, the Israelites, were out in the desert for 40 years, and they failed all their trials. Jesus, as Israel, he epitomizes, he incarnates Israel itself, and he goes to the desert for 40 days and does it right. Adam and Eve were set, tempted by Satan. They fail. Jesus is tempted by Satan. And he succeeds. Jesus is the one who keeps going back and redoing life for us the right way. That's part of his redeeming. And it's a hint to you and me that with his help, that can happen for us. And that he will make ways open. How many witnesses have you heard, Steve, of impossible redemptions of people's lives? Well, you think there's no way that's going to happen. You know, I remember a guy in New York, he was on charges in his drinking for abusing his kid who he used to lock up in a closet for hours at a time because he was busy drinking. I mean, it's one of those sick, like, oh, Lord. And I remember the day he came in. when his, This is about eight years into sobriety. And he reported to the group that he had a weekend coming up where his kid asked his mother, can I stay with dad this weekend? And he said, I, 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 I can't imagine that happened, how that happened. You know, Big Red, who has the auto parts thing. I mean, this, this guy went back to face charges in Connecticut that were like 20 years old because there was a warrant out. And by the time he went there, he had a letter of recommendation from a retired judge who sat on the Supreme Court of California. He had other stuff. He had a witness of a life. And, and they just canceled all the charges, man. But he was willing to go. And he was willing to face whatever they told him he was going to have to do, go into the can for 5 to 10, whatever it was. He was truly willing. Great witness. <coughs> so, you know, you're talking about Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. Don't count out how your life can get turned around. Don't, don't be like, oh, how, it's like stop thinking about it. You're self-centered, you schnook. Stop doing that. This is a Holy Spirit of God Almighty is going to be there to help make this happen. And he'll change you. One of the great things about doing these steps is the day you discover you've changed and you don't remember making an effort to. And for many alcoholics, it's simply one day they realize they don't want to drink and they go, I, when did that happen? When did that happen? And for others of us, it's having the conversation with the mom who knows how to push every button in your soul and body and getting off the phone and saying, I'm not hyperventilating. <laughs> wow. How did I, when did that happen? I'm, I'm okay. I'm not resonating with stuff. Do you know what I'm talking about, Penny? She knows. And, and so these miracles, you know, they're not going to make it into a TV movie, you know. But on your own level, these are huge. And they're a witness like, wow, I don't remember working on that, you know, doing a Joel Osteen, you know, positive reaffirmations every day. Love your mom, love your mom, love your mom, love your mom. I don't do that. <laughs> but something happened. Something happened. And I'm a different man. I'm a different woman. Purification, and the next step is illumination. But I put illumination... Purification. It's not that. It can be this and that and go back a little bit. 
God can give you a little bit of illumination and it charges you up for your purification. I think the transfiguration is an illumination. And like, wow, okay, kids, let's get on to purification now. And see, I see that happening very often. And Father Gillis, wonderful Orthodox preach, priest, talks on this. Illumination, on the other hand, is much more passive. Like the transfiguration, it's like, oh. we talked the whole season of epiphany, of God manifesting in your life, like noticing this. So it's more passive. It is a gift of seeing, of knowing, or of understanding that comes from a source deeper than our rational faculty. One's participation in illumination is to apply what is newly seen or known to deeper levels of repentance, new life, and purification. Do you see what I'm saying? Is the illumination will bring you back to a deeper purification. The 12 steps. Purification. We've got one to three, A, B, C. Do you ever hear that one? A, B, C, one, two, three? Admit, <laughs> believe, commit. Admit. What's the alcoholic do? He admits he's powerless over alcohol. Who are you powerless over? What are you powerless over? I, that's your business. But it's not just, well, I'm powerless over this or this. Yes, but what are you powerless over that's making your life unmanageable? And sometimes at the bottom line, if there aren't things like alcohol, the IRS, whatever you want to put in there, there's a sense of self. I'm powerless over myself. I'm stuck. You know, it's that old commercial, the poor old lady, I've fallen down, I can't get up. <coughs> Whatever. What you gonna do? When you hit that, <sighs> you gotta admit it. That's making my life unmanageable. Some people I hear pour out so much stuff to me, and, and then I say, well, it sounds like you need help. No, no, I'm okay. It's like, uh, I've been listening to this for 10 minutes, and you're telling me, well, no, I'm okay, I just need to say that. It's like, no. <laughs> you fool. You're not okay. Your life is unmanageable. So after admitting, then you come to believe that a power greater than yourself, God, is going to help you with this. You say, I can't. How do you come to believe? Frankly, I come to believe through the witness of other people. And they're saying, this is what it was like for me. Here's what happened. This is what it's like now. And if you hear it enough times from enough different people of a really motley group that's so different from and they're all speaking the same language and giving the same kind of experience of how life is for them now, even if, if you're a, a dead-souled atheist like I was, I want what they have. I mean, intellectually, it's very appealing to me that there is this God described in the Bible, in the New Testament, who's personal, who loves you, provides for you. So I, like, I mean, if there is that God, and that is his relationship to us, and he's our Father, and loves us, and wants to provide for us, I mean, if that were true, would I like him to be in charge of my life? Sign me up. <laughs> that sounds great. I mean, I'm going to live a life that he takes care of and ordains. It's like, I, yes, I don't believe it, but yeah, I would go for that in a minute. So do you believe? And it's primarily the witness of Scripture and other people you're going to come to believe or not. Or if you allow the possibility of God and look for God in your life, I guarantee you, you'll find God. He'll be revealed to you, as it was to me, in some simple way, perhaps. But it'll be undeniable, unless you really don't want God anyway. But if you're seeking God, if you open up your eyes on any given day and say, all right, God, if you're real, and these people I know say you are, please show yourself to me this day, please. I really earnestly want to somehow see something that tells me you really are who these people say you are. Watch what happens. 
And C, when you discover that God and believe in that God, commit to that God. Turn your will and your life over to God as you've come to understand him. And my coming to understand is as you begin to experience him and see him in the lives of other people, say, that's what I want. When I, as an atheist, first prayed to God, I said, I'm praying to whoever these people are praying to. And I had the idea there'd be other entities, so I'm saying, like, I'm not talking to anyone else or anything else. You know what I'm saying, Tara? I don't want some other weird spirit like grabbing on me. I'm not, I want you. You stay out. These people in AA that I'm hearing, they're telling their God stories. That's the one I'm praying to. And God revealed himself to me, and he took away my desire to drink that. That. Got my attention. Illumination, steps 10 through 12. This is where you're practicing these principles in your life on a daily basis. On awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day before we begin. So you've got your plans. That's okay. Make all the plans you want. Then run them by God. You're a salesman. You've got your day planned. Who are you going to hit? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to follow up with? Great. Now run it by the sales manager. See what he has to say. Yes, yes, no, I got that. Joey's going to take care of that. Why don't you go and take care of this? Okay, you're good to go. But you come in with your plans. That's us with God. And we ask God to direct our thinking especially asking it to be divorce from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Go ahead and live a life like that. Go start a day. God, I want to live a day today without any self-seeking motives. Good luck. That'll keep you humble. Gonna need God's help for that one. <clears throat> Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave us brains to use. And this supposes you've done those first nine steps. Amen? Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. This is the illumination part. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here, we ask God for inspiration, illumination, inspiration, an intuitive thought or a decision. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We're often surprised how the right answers come after we've tried this for a while. This is illumination. I keep telling you, you've got to do the first nine steps and make room for him to work in you for this to happen. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. You see why I read this stuff to you? It's in such everyday language that anyone can understand. Being still in experience and having just made conscious contact with God it's not probable that we're going to be inspired at all times. Oh, this is good to know, otherwise you think, I must be doing this wrong. You say, no, you're just new, keep trying. We might pay for this presumption, all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. You sort of get convinced, okay, that's what God wants me to do. Yeah, what the old guy from Star Night Live, yeah, that's a ticket, that's a ticket, yeah, nonsense. And you find out later and say, I guess that wasn't a God idea, <laughs> you know. I think that was a Michael idea. Oh, no. What's the help on that? Old Testament, Proverbs, a wise man seeks counsel. You got your inspiration. It's like, I'm going to run this by Steve. <laughs> what do you think, Steve? Or some other saint. Run it by them. Just like, sound good. It's like, yeah, I'm good. You're never alone. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration, and we come to rely on it. Our dependence is on God and the Holy Spirit helping us. Steve, how many hours could you log in giving witness of this being true in your life? And this man is a very hard-working lawyer who has to make a lot of decisions and come up with a lot of ideas. And in time again, he's there. Transformation really happens throughout the 12 steps. But by step 11, which is where we continue through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, at this point it's expected transformations really happen because then you're ready to be sent out as an apostle and share the good news with other people. 
Here's what transformation looks like. Well, if I'm transformed, how will I know I'm transformed? These in AA language are called the promises. These are the fruits that show up in a transformed life. If we're painstaking about this phase of our development, which has been purification and illumination, we will be amazed before we're halfway through. You don't have to wait till you get to the end. These things will begin to start evidencing themselves. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity. We will know peace. <laughs> no matter how far down the scale we've gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. Jesus Christ stands ready to redeem any and all parts of your life. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. I remember the first time in AA, I'm like three months sober, and a guy had his first year anniversary, and he's celebrating it. I started getting choked up, and, and I was surprised. It was the first time in years I felt for anyone else. You know, it's like, why am I caring about this guy? No, I was surprised. I was starting to care about other people. It began to matter. Self-seeking will slip away. Do you notice that self-sleeping will be completely removed from your life? It's like, no, it will slip away bit by bit. A whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Well, I went from atheist to God believer. I guess that's a pretty different outlook. Fear of people and economic security will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. That's the illumination. We will suddenly realize God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. I told you that, where people find all of a sudden they don't want to drink anymore, or they're not reacting the way they used to. They're not angry the way they, and they begin to realize, wow, when did that go? Well, the, the movement of God in our spirits, Mark, has not been sudden. But our appreciation sometimes is, is sudden. We're surprised. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among <clears throat> us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Listen to this, man. They will always materialize if we work for them. They will always materialize, flat out. Theosis is daunting exciting. Not that. Listen, theosis, hearing and doing the Father's will more and more perfectly. Okay? You put your arms around that. You can do that. In and through that, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed more and more into the image of Christ who did the Father's will perfectly. Don't be frightened by theosis. Be excited by it. Embrace it. Here's the closing to the explanation of the steps from the big book of AA. I love it. So, <laughs> abandon yourself to God as you understand God, Jesus Christ. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Say amen. 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 Would you all please stand now and join with me as we reaffirm our faith by saying the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> 